In this video, I want to dispel myths, misconceptions, and help all y'all set the right expectations when it comes to specifically the genre of wedding photography. What's up, my friends? My name is Pi. Welcome to slrlounge.com, your place for no-nonsense photography education. In this video, I have seven pieces of guidance. These are really things that I wish were told to me as a budding wedding photographer, joining the industry a little bit more than 10 years ago. Now, over the past 10 years, I have gained a little bit, a smidgen of wisdom. And what that's taught me, and you might've noticed this from my videos, is to just speak simply, boldly, plainly, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm just exhausted at the overall state of not only our industry, but just online education in general. I feel like from companies to brands to people, there are very few people out there just giving it to you straight, that are just telling you how it is without exaggerations, without lies, without understatements, all of that. I wanna make sure that I'm giving it to you straight. So let's go ahead, just dive straight into this. In these types of videos, this would be a great video. You can, you can, you can watch my face if you want, or you can simply listen podcast style as you get some work done and I just speak at you. Number one, let's talk about your watermark as a wedding photographer. Watermarks are great. Use them. Make them inconspicuous. Put them in the bottom left or the bottom right of your images and call it a day. But here's the mistake I see a lot of photographers making. They create these gigantic watermarks and they plaster it all over their images because they're worried about their images being stolen. Let's think on this for just a second. You're entering the wedding photography space and it's likely that you're creating a passable product, meaning there are clients out there willing to pay you for this product. But the types of images that you're creating, they're not really the types of images that people necessarily want to steal. Okay, they're not stock photographs, they're of couples and of specific people dancing and having a good time and specific memories. Most wedding photographers aren't shooting stock type images. And frankly, most wedding photographers aren't even creating a product that people would want to steal in any space and regard. And again, I'm speaking as much to my 30 year old self as I am to you guys. As a 40 year old, I wish I could have gone back and told the 30 year old self, hey dummy, your images aren't even good enough to merit stealing. But instead, I would slap these gigantic watermarks all over them. And the only thing that that did was lower the level of my work. It lowered the quality, it lowered the experience, it lowered everything. It made it unlikely that vendors would actually share it. It made it unlikely that clients would take those web resolution images and post them because they were gigantic advertising billboards for my business. On top of that, when we first entered the space, our logo wasn't even good. And I'm willing to bet that if you're first entering the space, your actual photography product is probably much better than your business branding. And what are you doing by slapping a giant watermark on it? You're putting the craptastic part of your business, the bad logo and branding design, right in the forefront over the image. You're overriding the quality of your work with something not so great. So watermarks are good, use them but put them in the bottom left, bottom right corner. Make them inconspicuous. Make them not noticeable. Allow people to share your work without being giant billboards. It's fine. Your images aren't going to get stolen. This brings me to point two. Your images just got stolen. Oh my goodness. Someone in the community wrote you a message and said, this other wedding photographer has taken your images and used them on their own website to market their product. Okay. Your blood is boiling. You're like, I listened to Pi, and this is what happened. How dare he? Look, this is going to happen from time to time, okay? Generally, the people that are going to steal your photographs and market their product with your photos are going to be fly-by-night photographers who just want to skip all the hard work and go to trying to con people out of their hard-earned money. These are literally con artists. They're people that are willing to steal. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to send them, what is it called? A DMCA, the Digital Millennial Copyright Act. Send them a takedown notice, okay? Send them a takedown notice. You want to post them online to be a social media example. Do what you got to do. But after that, after sending the takedown notice, I want you to move on with your life. So here's the deal. 
you could waste the time, resources, the money to go out and hire a lawyer to go after these people. But the problem is, even when your lawyer gets a hold of them, if they can get a hold of them, they don't got no money to pay damages. So what you end up doing is spending your own time, your own money to hire a lawyer, going out, finding out that these people don't have successful businesses and not getting anything in return. It's a huge waste of time, energy, and your money. Send the takedown notice. Make an example if you want. They will always end up shutting down their websites after this point, okay? And then move on with your life. Now, this goes to what if it's a legitimate company that's actually stealing your photographs? First, this rarely, if ever, happens. I mean, very rarely. Why? Because any legitimate person or business, anyone who's successful or runs a profitable, thriving business understands that you have to copyright or you have to license copyrighted artwork to use for advertising. They know this. And in the small chance that someone in that company made the mistake of not licensing your work, that is the time. If Apple or Microsoft or any of these companies, somehow they managed to get a hold of your wedding photographer, which again, what is the likelihood that you're even shooting photos that these companies would want to use? They're not stock photographs. But in that case, if you look into it and the person that's stealing is a legitimate business, that's when it's worth hiring a copyright lawyer and having them actually go after damages and claims. Then and only then, otherwise, don't waste your time. Number three, allow vendors to share the images that you shoot. Look, I would encourage each of you to drop the ego. I understand you're a photographer, you're an artist, you're going into a wedding day and you're creating a really cool product and that's great, that's amazing. Let the ego drop a bit, okay? Because as a wedding photographer, you are riding the coattails and the backs of every other vendor that put their time and effort into the floral design, the actual florist themselves, the wedding planning, the wedding design, the rental company, the DJ, the lighting, everybody, the venue themselves, all of the people that have put their time and effort into this wedding day, into this product, your images are the final result of all the people that have put their time and energy into that event. Allow these people to use your images to mark themselves. This is an expectation within the industry. And if you don't follow it, you're not going to make a lot of preferred vendor lists. You're not going to make a lot of friends. If your expectation is to ask these other vendors to license your photography, which features their work, your photography, which is good because of their work, you're not only going to end up with no license agreements, but you're going to end up with a lot of pissed off vendors. And in addition, companies like us who are willing to openly share with other vendors are going to take the forefront because you're unwilling. Let your vendors use your images to market their services. Simply ask that they credit or provide link backs wherever the images are used. The one exception to this is sometimes on occasion we'll have big properties and big venues that are basically national brands want to use our images for marketing purposes. Those are the specific instances where we say, okay, if it's going to be a national campaign and you don't want any crediting of the studio and all that kind of stuff, this is a case where we'd ask that you license. But otherwise, for your local florist, your coordinator, your, your designers, your rental companies, guys, these are small businesses just like ours. And coming through this post-COVID phase, they're going to need help just like you need help. Help each other and use each other's work to elevate one another's businesses. Number four, money trend FOMO. That's right, folks, the fear of missing out. So too often I see wedding photographers really do well and establish their business. They end up creating six-figure businesses, especially the ones that come through our business training systems. And then here's what happens their peers and the people in the industry sway their attention and focus into other areas. They see peers become successful selling workshops, so they want to sell workshops. They see peers go and sell presets, so they want to sell presets. They see peers get sponsorships and do speaking engagements, so they want to do these things. Look, I'm going to tell you straight up. 
You will always make more money. You will always be more successful by focusing on the task at hand, by focusing on what you do best. The photographers that are doing well in workshops, that is their primary business model. The photographers are companies that do well in presets. For example, we created vfpresets.com. It's a company dedicated to developing the best lighting condition based presets. So you have to have these focuses and too often I see photographers give up six figure businesses and six figure revenue streams to go and chase a few thousand dollars. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And you have to fight back against that constant FOMO that the industry is going to give you and swing you to whatever the latest trend is. Stick with what you're good at. Stick with what you're passionate about because what you can actually be passionate about in terms of the process itself and what you can stick with, that's where the money will be. For this reason, in our business training system, in the very first workshop, we discuss setting your core values and developing a mission statement. Look, a mission statement is as much as a to do as a what not to do. A mission statement is there to guide you away from distractions, to help you to know where not to put your time. That's almost a bigger problem because you're going to have the, the more successful your business is, the more opportunities you're going to have. And the problem isn't where to put your time is where not to put your time. So that's what your mission statement is for to keep you focused and on target. Number five, accept that social media is not real life. Okay. Most of us know this, yet we still somehow get sucked into the trap. And those of us on Instagram are the most susceptible to this. I mean, Instagram is the worst of the worst in terms of these platforms. We take 1% of our lives and we post it there as if that's our entire lives. This is one of those things when you fall into that social media trap kind of hardcore, it's one of the easiest ways when we go back to number four to get swayed by kind of these money trends, right? And the fear of missing out. Don't fall into it. It's not real. What you're seeing there is the best 1% of somebody's life, business, everything. Numero six. Sponsorships. Let's talk about them. So look, you are well into your career. You are doing good work as a wedding photographer. You have a good following, not only of clients, but also other photographers. And you have some, I hate the word, influence. You are an influencer. Blech. I hate that word. But look, you're at a place where you're considering sponsorships. I want to give it to you straight. First and foremost, understand that most of your peers, friends, people you've heard of, the big name photographers who have sponsorships, they're not actually monetary sponsorships, okay? There's not big money in getting sponsored by other photography companies, especially when it comes to the smaller brands. Once again, your own business is always gonna be more lucrative than sponsorships. Now, I'm gonna tell you how to make sponsorships work in just a second, but I feel like too often people are like, man, if I can just Nikon, if I can just get you know Canon to like step behind and like sponsor me, if I can just get these big companies, I'm gonna be rolling in it. That's not the way it works. More often than not, small to mid-size photography businesses will sponsor another person and usually provide sponsorships in terms of kind of like trade-off and marketing as well as like a gear stipend or product, okay? That's usually what it is. Now, larger companies, they do have a marketing budget for sponsorships. The Canons, the Nikons, the Pro Photos, these companies do have that. However, those budgets are not what you think. You're not gonna get thousands and thousands of dollars for simply saying you shoot with so-and-so's gear. It just doesn't work that way. So the way a sponsorship would typically work is that there's generally going to be some sort of a stipend that's offered to the photographer to create a certain amount of content, to use the product, to do all that kind of stuff. And there might be a certain budget set towards speaking engagements. Now, if you're a photographer that wants to travel from conference to conference, giving speeches after speeches, then you can make some money with this, but it's not crazy. You're talking 250 bucks, 500 bucks, maybe a thousand bucks for speaking gigs. So you have to do a lot of them to do well. Once again, your general business model of just shooting and working with clients is usually going to be far better, but you can always work this into kind of, if you'd like to parlay your photography success into also a career in education, 
you can use multiple sponsorships and kind of create a product line that can be self-sustaining. But in and of itself, these sponsorships are not gonna make you rich. They're just there. In addition, most sponsorships from larger companies come with significant strings attached. If y'all have noticed, I'm not sponsored by any major camera maker. It's not because I haven't been approached. It's because what they require from me is something I'm unwilling to do. All of these camera brands, once they have you in a sponsorship, they expect you to speak only of their product. You can only recommend Canon. You can only recommend Sony. You can only shoot on this. You can't post on... I saw one contract land on my desk that said I couldn't even use my iPhone. I couldn't teach people how to shoot with an iPhone or show an image online that was shot with an iPhone. That to me is crazy. Companies that limit my ability to speak honestly and openly, I don't work with them. This is one of the reasons that I love Profoto. Look, before we even had the sponsorship, I love their products. They make fantastic professional gear that is priced accordingly. It's frankly aspirational to a lot of people that are just getting into the industry and it's something that you work towards aspiring to get Profoto gear. But when that contract landed on my plate, they were completely good with me speaking openly and honestly. Meaning if my students came to me and they said, I can't afford this, what are other alternatives? They had no problem with me saying, look, use what you got. Here are some other options. Aspire to get into this. They were good with that. And because of that, I was good with being an ambassador with them. I love brands and companies like that. But I'm gonna be honest, most are not like that. Most are gonna to want to control what you say and they're gonna do it to a point where you're inauthentic to the audience that you would speak to. What happens there? Well, if you're inauthentic, you end up losing the audience that you originally had. So look, I'm not saying to not go after sponsorships. I'm saying that like anything else, if it's workshop or if it's presets or if it's sponsorships and education, you have to understand that if you're gonna go for this area and you wanna make a significant dent in your revenue, you have to make it part of your business plan. You have to make it part of your gig to go around and speak at these different conferences. And generally I'd say that would be far better of an idea in a post COVID society than right now, since these conferences aren't currently happening. But that's the expectation that I want you to set. Now let's talk about number seven. Wedding photography is gonna get me rich. Okay, look, wedding photography can be highly lucrative if you can stick with it. If you enjoy the process, and, and what I mean by this is it's too easy to fall into the notion of passion, right? Oh, I'm passionate about this. Well, passion is great, but what you need is passion for the entire process, not just passion for taking photographs. So if you have passion for the entire process of running a business, of marketing, of sales, of, of handling clients, of creating a good experience, and yes, of course, taking the good pictures, which is 10% of this process. If you have a passion for that, it will eventually become lucrative. You will eventually develop good wealth in this area. But I want you to realize something. In this space, and honestly in any space, there's no such thing as getting rich or wealthy off of one person, off of one client. Why do I say something that's, that's this kind of like obvious? Because if you actually understood this and you actually accept this, you will stop trying to look for one sponsor to give you a big $50,000 contract. You will stop trying to look for one client to take advantage of and get as much money you can out of their budget. You will stop trying to do these, these things that frankly are very short term and very nearsighted in kind of your vision and you will start looking more long term. Because how much money you make in the wedding photography space as well as in any other space or industry is in my opinion, directly attributable to how many people you're serving. You find a way to serve more people, to help more people, the revenue will expand as a natural byproduct. If you're serving only one person at a time, your revenue is gonna contract in relation to only serving one person at a time. If you made it to this part in the video, comment below. Now I'm gonna spit some gold at you. Look, I want you to understand this in relatable terms. I want you to know what this means in dollars and cents. Okay. There is no way you're going to hit your hundred thousand dollar a year revenue goal by serving one client. Okay. 
it's not going to work. You're not going to get rich off one client. If you're a high-end boutique wedding photography studio and you want to make $100,000 in revenue, not take home, just revenue, I want you to expect to serve between 10 to 20 clients. That's in revenue, right? So again, this varies based on what you're charging. But if you want to take home $100,000, then at a minimum, this is assuming that you have every cost and expense under control. Like you're, you're really, really good. At a minimum, double it. But usually a well-established business and a company that's well set up is gonna take home about 30 cents on the dollar. So for every $3, you're gonna take home one. That means that you need $300,000 of revenue to take home $100,000 at the end of the day. So that means as a boutique wedding photography studio, if you wanna take home hundred thousand dollars booking let's say seventy five hundred dollar weddings on average then you're gonna need that number you're gonna need somewhere between 30 to 40 weddings per year to be able to take home that number if you want to get into the seven figures so lineages of photography is a multi seven figure studio then you have to develop a system that can deliver a boutique experience and product across hundreds of clients per year, okay? So think about the revenue that you can generate from any of these areas as a direct byproduct of how many people you can serve. You're not gonna get rich off of just one. Same thing with sponsorships. You're not gonna make a ton of money off of one sponsorship. But if speaking and education is your gig and you're selling workshops and you also have 10 sponsors that line up and you have a, you have a tour around the country, where you can teach and serve thousands of photographers, yes, it's possible to create a very lucrative career. But that is a completely different business model. Well, that is it for this video. Look, if you guys are actually serious about photography as a business, I would highly recommend jumping into slrloungeworkshops.com, join premium, or at least purchase the business and the wedding training systems individually. This will speed up and amplify your ability to succeed in this industry by tenfold, if not more. We have thousands of photographers around the world that have built successful businesses using this training system, which is literally our operating manual for lineages of photography. So jump into that, check it out. In the meantime, I'd love for y'all to comment below. Let me know what you thought on this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And turn on notifications too because YouTube uh, doesn't actually notify you when you subscribe, which is odd. You gotta tell it twice. Tell it twice that you wanna be notified. All right, y'all. Hope you guys have a wonderful week and I'll see y'all next week, same time, same place. Peace.